If you were to ask any pastor about his hopes for his people's giving, you would probably get the same answer. Most pastors would think, first of all, about making sure all the needs are being met. We have to have enough to pay the bills, to take care of people's needs, to have enough to carry out the ministries of the church. We don't want there to be a shortfall. We don't want to be in a situation where we can't meet our budget or we have to cut back on vital ministries or perhaps cut back on staff, etc. We want to be a church that is providing for all the necessary ministry of the church. But then beyond that, most pastors would probably begin to think about expanding the ministry. You know, if we just had more money, we could do more than we are doing now. And there might be a list of ideas in their minds about what could be done if we had more resources available. We might be able to support more missionaries or to increase our facilities or add much needed staff or invest in new equipment or begin new outreach projects. But then there's another thought that might come to them, and that would be, you know, if we could be a church that sets an example in giving, it might inspire other churches to do more. We might be able to become an example for others to follow so that the Lord's work might expand in an even greater way. Well, that's where Paul was on that third level. You might call these good, better, and best. And Paul always wanted the best. And please understand his motive for wanting this for the Corinthians. He was really saying, I love you so much, I want the best for you. I want you to have the best, and I want you to be the best. And so what we have in the first five verses of chapter 9 is a call to exemplary giving. Remember now, the Corinthians had been out in front in this offering for the suffering saints in Jerusalem. They had been the first to jump on board with this. Their original enthusiasm had inspired the Macedonians to get involved, even though they were extremely poor. And we know that Paul then went back and pointed to the Macedonians as an example to the Corinthians, but we have to remember it was the Corinthians that started it all. And in Paul's mind, this offering is a very worthwhile project. Not only would it provide much needed relief for starving Christians in Jerusalem, but it would go a long way in healing the great divide between Jewish believers and Gentile believers. And of course, we know what it was that had put a halt to the giving of the Corinthians. The false teachers had turned them against Paul, and therefore the offering was put on hold. And it stayed that way until reconciliation could take place. But now the relationship has been restored, and Paul is urging them to get back to the priority of this offering. And there's something else we need to keep in mind. From the way this is worded in these two chapters, it is likely that the Corinthians had made a pledge to give a certain amount. And this is why Paul was saying, I don't want to get there and then have to drum up the rest of it when I arrive. You need to have it all collected before I come. In fact, Paul is even sending some brothers with Titus to make sure it is ready. But here in chapter 9 verses 1 through 5, it's almost like Paul wants them to go beyond their original pledge. It's like he's saying, 
why do good if you can do better? And why do better if you can do best? And so he says to them, I want you to be exemplary in your giving. I want you to set the standard for all the other churches. And whereas I have been boasting about the giving of the Macedonians, I want to be able to boast about you even more. By the way, before we move into this text, Paul makes a comment here that he's saying what he's about to say may appear to be redundant. He's going to repeat some things that he's been saying all along. And so we may initially think, well, wait a minute, Paul's already said this. He acknowledges that. But he's writing this section to explain to them why he feels compelled to send these other brothers with Titus. And that is new information along with some of the things that he's already said that he's reiterating to them. In fact, this is really probably a bad place for a chapter break because it's a continuation of what he's been talking about. And the thought of verse 1 flows right out of the previous verse, which in this case is the last verse of the previous chapter. But in essence, what he's saying to them is, I want you to prove your love and vindicate my boasting about you. And we're going to see both of those same ideas in the text this morning. He also wants to make sure the Corinthians are going to be prepared when he eventually gets there. In fact, he's going to say to them, if I come to you and there just happens to be a Macedonian traveling with me, it's going to be extremely embarrassing to you if you are not ready with your generous offering. And so that's the gist of what we see here. But let's get into it in more detail. We're going to see this in three parts, but we're going to have some sub points in that last point. We begin with the confidence, the confidence. Notice the gracious way in which Paul approaches this in verse 1. For it is super, superfluous for me to write to you about this ministry to the saints. He's not browbeating them. In fact, it almost sounds as if he's apologizing. He's saying it's really superfluous for me to go over this again. The word for superfluous is perissos. It's probably better translated redundant. This is a word that Paul has already used in chapter 2, verse 7, to speak of overwhelming sadness. This is sadness that is excessive. So Paul is saying, you know, it may be excessive for me to go over this again. So today we might say, this is over the top. Paul, this is over the top you, for you to keep going back over this. The word can mean extraordinary, remarkable, abundant, or profuse. Some translations have unnecessary. So Paul is saying, you know, it might appear to be unnecessary, but I want to make sure you get it. The word for right is a present active infinitive, so it has the idea of keep on writing. And Paul, why do you keep on writing about this? So it might be something like you may be wondering why I keep on writing about this, but I want you to know it's for your benefit. Not only will it help the suffering saints in Jerusalem, but it will help you as well. And going on into verse 2, he says that the reason this is superfluous is because he's already written to them about it. In fact, he's written more than once. He says, I know your readiness. He had fully explained this whole process of collecting the offering back in 1 Corinthians 16, verses 1 through 3. 
And now he has knowledge of the fact that they're ready to get back on this. Someone perhaps has communicated that to him. But look at verse 2 again. For I know your readiness of which I boast about you to the Macedonians, namely that Achaia has been prepared since last year and your zeal has stirred up most of them. Paul is expressing great confidence in them. And whereas earlier he had been lifting up the Macedonians as the prime example of sacrificial giving, now he's saying that he has been boasting to the Macedonians about those in Achaia. And he uses Achaia here instead of Corinth because this includes more than just Corinth. It is true that the capital of Achaia is Corinth, but there were other believers in that larger region who were also participating in this offering. Guthrie writes, much ink has been spilled suggesting reasons why Paul refers to Achaia here rather than Corinth, yet it should be remembered that from the very first words of this letter, Paul has been addressing the church of God, which is at Corinth, with all the saints who are throughout Achaia. And he says to them, I know you're ready to give again, and I have confidence in you that I will even be able to boast to the Macedonians about you. And he says, I know your readiness was there from the beginning before you got sidetracked by the false teachers. And I know you're ready now to return to this high priority. In fact, he's saying, I want you to get back to your original motivation and to do so with such zeal that I will be able to boast to the Macedonians that you are once again the example to follow. And remember, it was your zeal that stirred up the rest of them. And so you need to return to that same level of zeal that you had in the beginning because I want to be able to say to the Macedonians, give like the believers in Achaia. And Paul is saying, I have confidence in you that you'll do this very thing. This is a positive affirmation. He's expressing his confidence in them. And by the way, Paul uses the word boasting more than any other New Testament writer. It's really kind of a favorite expression of his. And he usually has a positive tone in mind when he uses it. This is not prideful boasting. It is a godly kind of boasting. Paul uses this term more than 35 times. And he employs it as a way of expressing confidence in God as he works in and through believers. So keep in mind, this is a godly boasting. And Paul is expressing great confidence in the Corinthians that they will do the right thing. So in verses 1 and 2, we have the confidence but in verses 3 and 4, he moves on to the concern, the concern. Look with me at verse 3. But I have sent the brethren that are boasting about you may not be made empty in this case. Paul says, I don't want my boast to be an empty one. And that's why I'm sending these brothers to you. Remember now, there are three men that are going to Corinth ahead of Paul. Titus, we know, but there are two others that are unnamed. At least one of them, we know, is a preacher of the gospel. But these are representatives from the churches. And from now on, Paul will just refer to them as the brethren. They are the ones who are going to be delivering this letter of 2 Corinthians to them. And he says, this is the reason why I'm sending them, I don't want my boast to be in vain. In fact, in verse 4, he gets very specific. 
He says, lest if any Macedonians come with me and find you unprepared, we, not to speak of you, should be put to shame by this confidence. Paul says, I'm going to be embarrassed, but so are you. Oh, but we need to understand here. This is much more than just mild embarrassment. The Greek word that is used here is a word that means deep shame or humiliation. Guthrie explains that for the Greco-Roman culture in which honor and shame shaped a significant framework for relationships at all levels of society, this term connoted much more than our modern concept of embarrassment. In fact, one Bible scholar reports that it was not uncommon in that culture to have your name published in the Athenian Agora if you defaulted on a pledge you had made. This was a public shaming similar to having your reputation destroyed today on social media. But the point here in 2 Corinthians 9.4 is that this is a very ser serious consideration. You would not want to get shamed like this. Was it, what was it that was specifically going to bring this kind of shame to the Corinthians. We'll look at verse 4 again. Lest if any Macedonians come with me and find you unprepared. Now, I think what he's saying here is he's saying, you know, when I come to you on my third visit there, I just might bring some Macedonians with me. And if I do, and you're not prepared with the offering, you're going to be shamed. Kent Hughes puts it in dramatic terms. He writes, imagine the potential for humiliation. The poverty-stricken Macedonian church, upon hearing of the rich Corinthians' readiness to give had reached down in their affliction and poverty and overflowed in a wealth of generosity, giving beyond their means, even begging Paul for the honor of relieving the saints. He says, picture a ragged party of Macedonians appearing in Corinth and finding the wealthy Corinthians unprepared. Imagine them having to explain to these poor Macedonians that they have only collected a small portion of what they had promised. Folks, that would not be good. It would bring them much shame. And then Paul adds, in essence, and not only that, I'm going to suffer shame because I've been boasting about you believing that you would do what you have committed to do. And Paul is saying, I don't want that. I want you to be an example in your giving. I want you to follow through on your pledge. I want you to be fully prepared. Now, how does that apply to us today? We may not live in the same kind of culture they lived in, but we can still be shameful in our lack of giving. John MacArthur writes, a stingy congregation, a congregation that doesn't give, a congregation that doesn't meet the needs of its own church life, sets a bad example, a dishonorable example. On the other hand, a faithful, generous, giving church can be a model for other churches to follow. That's Paul's message. And I would add to that, if we want to be a church that sets an example to others, then we should go beyond that of just meeting the needs of our church. We should give in such a way that the kingdom of God is able to spread around the world in an ever-increasing way. 
Let's move from the good category to the better and maybe even to the best. And listen, folks, you here at Parker Bible Church have always been excellent givers. You are no doubt beyond the good category. Every single time there has been a need in this church, you have stepped up and met that need. You know, I just think of this past year during the COVID crisis, we had the best year financially that we've ever had. And I want you to know I'm very grateful about that. You know, we've had enough to be concerned about this year without having to worry about whether the bills are going to be paid. But the question always remains, can we do more? Is there more the Lord would want us to accomplish? Are there ways we could expand our ministry impact if we gave more? These are always questions we should consider. The Lord may want to use this church to set an example for other churches in how to give. And his message to us may be the very same message Paul had for the Corinthians. And what we need to note here in 2 Corinthians 9 is that Paul is not settling for stewardship that is marginal or even good. He is expecting stewardship that is exceptional and exemplary. Paul wants the Corinthians to set the standard. And the way this is worded, it implies the possibility that the Corinthians might not come through on this, but Paul has confidence that they will. This also implies that it is Paul's intention to have representatives from the churches in Macedonia with him when he comes. So this is his concern. He wants the Corinthians to be ready but there's a third thing that we see here as well, and that's the conclusion, the conclusion. Look with me at verse 5. So I thought it necessary to urge the brethren that they would go on ahead to you and arrange beforehand your previously promised bountiful gift that the same might be ready as a bountiful gift and not affected by covetousness. Now that's how the New American Standard reads, but there's a fairly wide range of interpretation here. I'll come back to that in a moment. Verse 5 gives us Paul's conclusion and serves to summarize this passage. It rounds out this unit by explaining to the Corinthians why he's sending this delegation with Titus. The word so in the New American Standard is variously translated consequently or therefore. It's a connecting word, but it often points to a conclusion. Because of the concerns in verses 3 and 4, Paul has arrived at this conclusion. To avoid potential humiliation, as he talks about in verse 4, Paul has decided to enact a prevention, and he explains that prevention here. The conclusion is comprised of three parts, the exigency, the execution, and the effect. And we'll take these one at a time. The first one is the exigency. Now, that's not a word we use every day, but let me give a definition of it. A need, demand, or requirement intrinsic to a circumstance or condition. In other words, it is a necessary action. So here's the exigency. Verse 5, I thought it necessary to urge the brethren that they would go on ahead to you. Notice the key words here, the words necessary and urge. First of all, this is something Paul feels is necessary. And that implies the sending of these men is not optional. It is critical to ensure that the Corinthians are going to carry out their promise. 
And you know, sometimes you have to help people build a structure of accountability to help them follow through on their commitments. I know that is an important aspect of biblical counseling. The counselor aids in biblical change by giving assignments and by building that structure of accountability. Paul knew the Corinthians needed this. He knew they would be much more likely to complete the offering if they had some men from the churches to help oversee the process. But notice the word urge. This is a well-known Greek word, parakaleo. It basically means to come alongside of. And of course, this is the root word from where we get the word paraclete, the Holy Spirit that comes alongside us to enable us to live the Christian life. In this context, it has to do with the idea of coming alongside to strongly encourage. He's encouraging these men to go on ahead and make sure the Corinthians are ready with the offering. But here we see that the urging is done with urgency. It has a strong tone to it. Secondly, we see the execution. Look at verse 5 again. So I thought it necessary to urge the brethren that they would go on ahead to you and arrange beforehand your previously promised bountiful gift. Stop right there. One translation interprets the phrase arrange beforehand as to organize in advance. It's the word katartizo. It basically means to put into order. Now, we can't say this for certain because we're not told here, but this very well may imply that these men were especially skilled in finances. They may have been known for their giftedness in money management. Whether or not that is true, they would at least provide some accountability and assistance in making sure the Corinthians were ready with their offering when Paul arrived. Paul is essentially saying, I can't come right now, but I'm sending these men on ahead to help you. You've made a pledge, and they're going to be there to help you follow through with your pledge. And notice the language here, your previously promised bountiful gift. When they first heard about this need, they, they made a promise. They pledged to give a certain amount. They set a goal. And notice it's a huge amount. The word for bountiful means a large amount. We don't know how much it was, but we can safely say it was a significant amount. We also don't know how much they have raised to this point, but there's a good chance they still had quite a bit to raise to reach their promised goal. And so Paul is urging these brethren to go on ahead of him and assist them in this effort. But perhaps the most important thing is what he says at the end of verse 5. So finally, we see the effect, the effect. Look at verse 5 one more time. So I thought it necessary to urge the brethren that they would go on ahead to you and arrange beforehand your previously promised bountiful gift that the same might be ready as a bountiful gift and not affected by covetousness. Now here's where the variance comes in. The New American Standard has it not affected by covetousness. But other translations render it not as one grudgingly given or not as a grudging obligation. Kent Hughes has it not as an exaction from a grudging spirit. Now, certainly a heart of covetousness could derail them from following through on this offering, 
But there may be more here than that. It seems as if Paul's main concern is that the Corinthians not only follow through with this, but that they do it with the right heart. He doesn't want them to do this under compulsion, but with a cheerful heart, and that's what he's getting ready to say in the next few verses. And Paul's hope is that the arrival of this delegation, along with this letter of 2 Corinthians, will lead them then, then to the level of giving from like the Macedonians did from the heart. This is the only way they're going to be blessed. And Paul is always looking out for their spiritual best. The word for covetousness in the New American Standard is the word pleonexia. It's a word that can be interpreted in a number of different ways. It can mean covetousness, but it can also mean greediness, avarice, or wanting more than one is due. In short, it constitutes a self-centered, stingy attitude. So it's clear that what Paul is doing here is he's contrasting two different attitudes, two hearts when it comes to giving. One is the heart of giving that pleases God. The other is the selfish attitude that is a grievous offense to God. And if you look at how this word is used elsewhere in the New Testament, you find this attitude of stinginess, greediness, is one that defiles a person and one that our Lord said we should guard against with all diligence. Paul includes this attitude in a list of vices that characterizes ungodliness. So Paul is saying to the Corinthians, I don't want you to, I don't want you to give with a heart like that. I want you to give willingly and joyfully. So this is Paul's call to exemplary giving. And I believe it still applies to the church today. This is the kind of giving that is pleasing to God and glorifies him. This is the kind of giving that we should be emulating. Now we have been, for the last three weeks, looking generally at the subject of fundraising. So I want to end this section with a list of questions that have been developed to determine if a fundraising campaign is biblical and honoring to the Lord. Before you get involved in any kind of fundraising effort, you should ask yourself these questions of those who are asking for your donation. Do they have a definite and personal commitment to Jesus Christ? Do they have an unclouded commitment to the authority of Scripture? Are they involved in that which is defined as a biblical mission? Is there prayerful dependence on God more than dependence on current strategies and techniques? Is there an obvious love and concern for those ministered to? Is there evidence of maturity, Christ-likeness, and integrity? Is there the spirit of servanthood and humility rather than presumption or arrogance? Is it God-centered rather than man-centered? Are the furnishings and lifestyles in that ministry modest and unpretentious? Have they demonstrated responsible use of funds for purposes that are given? Are there non-manipulative tactics being used? No continuous crisis or inducements to give that will cause you to lose your eternal rewards? Is there a track record of spiritual fruits? Have you seen it? Is there 
responsibility to the leadership of a local church? Or is this giving to and through a local church? Are there good personal relationships among the ministry staff? And is there a pronounced eternal perspective? Now, I think that's a great list. I don't know where that originally came from, but John MacArthur points to it. The point is we should always ask questions and we should demand integrity. This is what Paul has been talking about. This is the way we can get involved in the kind of giving that is biblical and is pleasing and honoring to the Lord. That's our goal. Not only do we want to make sure we're faithful to give, but we want to give with the right heart. We want to give in the right way. We want to honor God with our giving. Let's pray together. Father, we pray you would help us to not only grasp these truths, but Lord, to be committed to applying them, not only in our own personal lives as stewards and as your disciples, but Lord, that we as a church would follow these principles as well, that we would be biblical in all we do. And Lord, we pray once again that as we respond to your word, that we would be pleasing in your sight. We pray if there are any that do not know Christ, that they would come to know your saving grace today. We pray that all of us would be growing and becoming sanctified and more Christ-like every day, and that we might bow, that we might yield, that we might submit to your authority in every way and help us to do that in this specific area of giving. Help us as we respond to you now. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. Well, we're gonna have some elders here near the front at the end of our service. They're here to help you if you need to receive Christ today, if you need to be a part of this church family, following baptism, you need a word of counsel, you need someone to pray with you, whatever that might be this morning, make some kind of public commitment to the Lord, maybe to renew your commitment and giving as a steward, whatever that might look like this morning, these men will be here uh, to help you with that. Well, I want to mention one need this morning before we dismiss. We have a flooded basement. Uh, the Farron family has a flooded basement, and uh, uh, I'm just going to leave this note up here on the pulpit. It has the address and the phone number on it. So if you need that information, you can come up here and get it. But at 2 o'clock this afternoon, they need some help getting all their stuff out of the basement because it's got some water in it, um, and there seems to be more and more coming all the time. So they need some help with that. So if you can help out with that, uh, lend a hand 2 o'clock this afternoon, or anytime you can help, uh, you can contact Michael Ferens. So that's a need. All right. Uh, hope that you'll be back tonight. We're going to be starting. I, th I think the weather's going to be okay. I think we're, we're not going to have, we might have a little snow, but, you know, we're Coloradans. We can handle that. Um, but be back tonight. Uh, we're going to start through the book of Daniel, which is a very relevant book uh, for our day and time. I'm excited about that study. I hope that you'll come and be back with us. We'll start it tonight. All right, let's stand together. Pastor Michael's coming as we sing. <laughs>